Mark Todd uh, was my student then, and uh, still, still see it, still can see his face right now. We just walked in the house and uh, we are sitting there and it sounded like a freight train coming. And of course, Daddy, he knew what it was. He told us to get in the kitchen floor. The UN tornado first appeared as a severe thunderstorm over in eastern Mississippi. We later issued a tornado warning based on that thunderstorm, I believe for northern Lamar County. And as the thunderstorm continued northeast, it never weakened a bit, and it even grew stronger. So when it got into uh, approaching Marion County, it looked like it was a powerful tornado. You have to have a flashlight because there was so much illumination. And you could, you, you, you could see it real good, but you couldn't, it was so many trees, you just had to climb over, under, whatever you had to do to get out. Although 50 years have come and gone, the people of Gouin still remember. Forever, forever. The day April 3rd, 1974 strikes a nerve with anyone born in the East Central and Southeastern United States in the 1960s or before. The 1974 super outbreak may not have had as many tornadoes as the April 2011 super outbreak, but the sheer violence and widespread destruction it caused remains unmatched. An astounding 30 tornadoes were rated F4 or F5 across 13 states and an F3 in Southern Canada. The most famous tornado and simultaneously the deadliest tornado from this outbreak was the giant tornado that struck the town of Xenia, Ohio a tornado famously given unheard of preliminary F6 by Dr. Tetsi of Vegeta. However, the tornado I wanted to give some more insight on today is actually the final F5 of the outbreak that devastated the town of Ewan, Alabama, a city about 80 miles northwest of Birmingham. Before I dive directly into the specifics of this storm, I wanted to take a moment to look at the procedures by which tornado warnings were issued in 1974 and show why this event was the catalyst for the improvement of the warning process throughout the late 1970s all the way into the mid-1990s. The 1974 super outbreak was well forecast for the time. I'm sure many of you have heard how radar maintenance was ordered to be done on April 2nd so that they would be prepared for the next day. The weakness of that era of warning systems was not large-scale forecasting. By the 70s, forecasters were able to identify the ingredients needed to predict when tornadoes and even strong tornadoes were possible. The crack in the armor that April 3rd and 4th exposed was how difficult it was to identify when multiple tornadoes were on the ground and get that information to the public in a way that gave them enough time and information to act. Modern Doppler radar as we know it wasn't developed until the late 80s and wouldn't be available in all markets until August of 1997. Prior to the development of WSR-88 or NEXRAD, meteorologists had to use WSR-57, which was 1950s technology based on military radar and looking at old imagery shows just how difficult it was to identify tornadoes through this method. They were forced to just look for hook echoes, which can be obvious at times, but WSR-57 only had access to reflectivity so things we take for granted now, like tornado debris signatures and velocity couplets, were not able to fill in the gaps for reflectivity contamination caused by messy storms, QCLS storm modes, or even just supercells that were further away from the radar and thus harder to interpret. The high degree of difficulty in reading radar was combined with a primitive teletype system where warnings would be manually fed into these typewriters that connected to the phone lines. This also caused a bit of delay. Despite all these obstacles, a report on the tornado outbreak done by the newly formed NOAA National Disaster Survey Team found that most of the storms were at least somewhat well-worn thanks to skilled operators of the WSR-57 radars and assistance from the ATS-3 satellite used to gain an additional view of developing storm systems from space. However, this leads us back to the Alabama section of the outbreak, as the Gouin tornado struck the town at around 9.02 p.m., well after the sun had already set, 
and ATS-3's ability to help meteorologists spot storm system development after sundown was nearly non-existent. Unfortunately, this, along with some of the unique attributes of the Cuban tornado, made it one of the deadliest of the outbreak, despite striking a very rural part of the state. Ewan is a small town in Marion County within 100 miles of both the Birmingham Metro and Tuscaloosa, both areas with a history of violent tornadoes both up to this point and in the following years. West Alabamians and Alabamians in general were familiar with these storms. While the previously mentioned NOAA report showed how many citizens, businesses, and even local governments had little to no understanding of tornado action plans or even the difference between watches and warnings, they found that the people of Ewan were well aware of the warning process and many even had plans of actions in the case of an approaching tornado. The reality was that this tornado was the final F5 of the outbreak and among the last violent tornadoes of the outbreak, and it happening after sunset was truly a worst-case scenario as a Wednesday in Alabama meant people were returning from a long day of work as well as evening church services. It's likely that had the tornado struck an hour or two earlier while church services were still in session, that the death toll may have been higher as the two most popular churches in the area were both leveled by the tornado. While a true worst-case scenario may have been avoided, it does not change the fact that one of the most violent and unique tornadoes on record devastated a nearly unprepared town while many were either sleeping or were in the process of winding down after a busy day. The Cuban tornado is one of many nocturnal tornadoes that we have no actual imagery of what it looked like outside of assumptions made by examining its devastation. While images and videos of the Xenia, Ohio tornado, as well as the Sailor Park, Ohio tornadoes, are widely available and are spectacular resources for furthering our understanding of tornadoes, Ewan has no confirmed videos or even a single photo. The most unique aspect of this tornado is actually its assumed forward speed. Reported by weather.com as moving at a highway speed peak of 75 miles per hour. While tornado forward speed is a difficult metric to track due to the ephemeral nature of these forces of nature, a tornado capable of clocking a speeding ticket is still incredibly frightening. No tornado has ever been caught well enough on tape that rivaled Gouin's alleged forward speed and intensity to even give us an idea of what this monster might have looked like if it had actually reached the 70 plus miles per hour. Well, that is until May 16th of this year. This is the Marion, Illinois EF4 that raced through Williamson County at somewhere between 60 and 80 miles per hour. The official report comes in at an average of 60, but the videos circulating certainly seem to show peak speeds, which are likely around 70 to 80 miles per hour. This monster moved incredibly quickly over its roughly 17-mile trek, displaying damage consistent with 190 miles per hour wind, landing in the high-end EF4 range and tying the Diaz-Arkansas tornado from the Pi Day outbreak for the strongest tornado of the year so far. Remember, just because a tornado is not an EF5 does not mean it is not a deadly storm capable of dangerous behavior that endangers life and property. The Ewan tornado path is in some ways contentious, as reports of a funnel cloud visible from Starkville, Mississippi, are sometimes considered the beginning of the path, while Dr. Fujita has a tornado beginning near the Alabama-Mississippi state line, north of Caledonia in Lowndes County, Mississippi. We'll go with Mr. Tornado on this one to make it easier. The tornado is estimated to touch down around 8.50 Central Time. The contention on the path is likely due to the tornado beginning as an F-Zero tornado that caused mostly marginal damage until it reached Lamar County, Alabama. There, the tornado rapidly intensified, destroying the Lamar County Airport, as well as doing intense vegetation damage throughout this rural stretch of northwestern Alabama. Small communities were impacted by the strengthening tornado, with several residential homes damaged or destroyed. The storm became tornado warned at around 9 p.m. Central, after imagery from the radar in Centerville, Alabama, indicated a hook echo approaching the community of Ewan from the southwest. Here is a transcription of the warning that was issued. Note the massive difference in verbiage from modern warnings. Less intense wording to prevent the induction of panic was extremely common during this time. Unfortunately for the residents of Ewan, the storm impacted the Monterey Mobile Home Plant, a leading job provider in the area, at around 9.02 p.m., only two minutes after the warning was issued. Almost assuredly, many whose homes were impacted by the tornado only had the sorrowful roar of the tornado itself as a warning. Speaking of the roar, it was captured via tape player by Gwyn resident Alan Lindley. Here is a small snippet of that audio that was captured. audio can be found for free on the Tornado Talk website in their article on the Gwyn Tornado, which is another source I used to fact check much of the information I came across online. 
I strongly recommend checking them out if you've never visited the site somehow. Back to the audio. There are rumors online that audio engineers were able to study the tape and determine Guin had wind speeds of 288 miles per hour based on the frequencies of the tape. But nothing I came across online seemed to be a reliable source for this, and thus I do not believe it to be true. However, I think it's important to mention and debunk these kinds of rumors. The tornado moved from the Monterey Mobile Home Factory and continued to decimate downtown Guin, damaging a large percentage of the businesses in the city, including a gas station where Jimmy Heron would be killed when the store collapsed around him. Much of Guin was devastated, with various private businesses as well as City Hall sustaining significant catastrophic damage. Sadly, the tornado's carnage would not stop here, as a large portion of the residential area of Guin was firmly in the path of this fast-moving F5 tornado. The twister continued its trek through the city, scouring the ground between pulverizing trees and raising homes down to their foundation. Ground scouring occurs when the tornado digs small trenches into the ground and occurs almost exclusively in violent tornadoes, especially when the ground being ruined is Dixie Alley red clay. The Pew family emerged from their home to search for their neighbors Joseph and Jesma Shirey, who were both over the age of 70, digging them out of the rubble where their home once stood. Unfortunately, both would pass away from their injuries. The Gilmore family lived in a trailer home, and the mother Ellen Gilmore would pass from her injuries the next day after their trailer was tossed and pulverized by the tornado's windfield. The tornado also destroyed Ewan First Baptist Church, killing an elderly woman named Eva Holsey who lived in a small residence in close proximity to the building. The tornado caused similar scenes across Guin, where survivors would emerge from their basements and shelters with the wails of their fellow members of their tight-knit community who lay trapped and broken beneath the entrails of what had once been their home. Those who describe it really a haunting scene, like a war zone where all survivors can do is try to dig their friends and neighbors out of the rubble until first responders arrive. The Miller family had a storm shelter near their property, which proved to save their lives as well as several neighbors. Fourteen people took shelter in the concrete bunker. The Brown family, who also lived nearby, were unable to make it in time, and unfortunately, teenager Janet Brown and her parents Virginia and Billy were three of the 23 lives lost in the Guin community. The tornado would track all the way to the Huntsville area, scaling nearly 2,000-foot mountains and ripping through valleys and gorges found throughout the north-central part of Alabama. One of many conventional wisdoms about tornadoes was that tornadoes could not traverse high and low elevation, needed mostly flat ground to continue. The Guin Tornado's 80-mile trek through the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains disproved both points. In those 80 miles, the storm completely destroyed nearly 600 buildings and damaged hundreds more. The storm injured 332 people and took the lives of 28, one of the deadlier storms of the outbreak, and 23 of those lives lost were in Guin. The true extent of the devastation would not be known until the following morning. Dawn revealed a town that had been ravaged by one of the strongest tornadoes to ever strike the state of Alabama. Dr. Tetsuya Fujita himself rated some of the damage in the town as F5 level, placing the Guin tornado as the final of the record seven F5s that occurred on April 3, 1974. In a podcast in 2024 commemorating the 50th anniversary of the outbreak, meteorologist James Spann declared that in all his years observing violent tornadoes, including the April 2011 outbreak, he believed that the Guin tornado was the most violent damage he had ever personally seen. In that same podcast, the now mayor of Guin, Phil Seagraves, who experienced the event as a 19-year-old, described feats like the tornado ripping the cola out of bottles while leaving the bottles and racks intact. This would indicate extreme pressure differences and would be consistent with an extremely violent storm. The city of Guin was rebuilt despite many businesses leaving the area, including the Monterey Mobile Home Plant, which was not rebuilt after the parent company, Winston, chose to just declare the destruction as a loss and go elsewhere. The rebuilding was done through a close-knit community as well as determination and faith. The storm is still a tough topic for remaining survivors, but a beautiful memorial was placed downtown to honor both those who lost their lives as well as those who were left behind and had to pick up the pieces after such a terrible tragedy. Small West Alabama town is an excellent example of how communities can come together after tragedy and endure anything. The 1974 outbreak became the catalyst for the expanding of tornado safety throughout the United States, with the storms that struck Xenia and Louisville showing the country the power of these devastating storms and that they could strike urban areas if the conditions were right. The Guin storm happening in the late evening meant that the national attention was not as available, and the tornado was largely forgotten outside of Alabama for many years, despite the incredible devastation it caused. Weather safety improved after the super outbreak, but tornadoes like Guin continue to cause terrible disasters even to this day. Guin's tornado was nocturnal, and while it happened 50 years ago, Many comparisons can be drawn between it and the deadly overnight tornadoes that are occurring in the 2020s. 
If you follow weather a bit, you'll be aware of examples like the Western Kentucky tornado in December of 2021 that devastated communities like Mayfield and Dawson Springs and took 57 lives. Or the 2023 Rolling Fork tornado that killed 17 people in a small town by the same name in Western Mississippi, or even the Somerset, London, Kentucky tornado from earlier this year, which took 19 lives. The reality is that nocturnal tornadoes are incredibly dangerous no matter what safety measures are in place. If people are asleep, they will be unable to properly protect themselves or their families, especially if they are unaware of any impending threat. Sometimes a cell phone warning is not enough, particularly for older individuals who are hard of hearing. Of the 19 people who passed in the Somerset London tornado, 18 of them were aged 48 or older. While not true in every scenario, these nocturnal tornadoes tend to disproportionately affect older individuals who may have either been unable to hear the warnings due to being deaf or hard of hearing or physical limitations affecting their ability to enact a safety plan in a timely manner. These overnight tornadoes are still killing people today, and the only way to improve this is better safety practices, more research in social science, and a continued government investment in the NOAA and NWS. Weather safety is important to the American people, and you should make sure your local and state governments know that so that they can represent you properly. If you or a loved one lives in a region where tornadoes are common, I encourage you to make sure you and they have multiple avenues of receiving alerts. Phone alerts and weather apps are great ways to receive warnings, but also encourage the use of NOAA weather radios. They are battery operated and still send alerts when power and cell communications are down. You can purchase them online or at local retailers like Walmart and Target. Also, wear a helmet. Many tornado fatalities are a result of blunt force trauma to the head or neck, and a simple bicycle helmet can save lives. They're not just for kids to feel safe, they can save your life too. Tornado safety is important, and you should take it seriously. You never know if one split-second decision, like buying your family $5 bicycle helmets, can save you or your family's lives. By encouraging the proper precautions and helping assure that others in your community are weather aware, you are saving the lives of mothers, fathers, children, grandparents, grandchildren, friends. I could go on and on, but the point is that every life lost in a tornado is precious, and they each deserve to be remembered and respected by trying to make sure these tragedies don't happen again. Stay safe and thank you for watching.